Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Are we experiencing the great recession of 2015 or merely a painful paradigm shift on how the global economy is run? Many in the West quickly blame China for mismanagement of its economy and currency. This may or may not be true, but this is only a small fraction of a much bigger story. Has anything been learned since the financial crisis of 2008? To Crosstalk the Global Economy, I'm joined by my guest, Mitch Feierstein in New York. He is a fund manager and author of the book, Planet Ponzi. In Washington, we have Mark Weisbrot. He is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And in London, we cross to Stephen Keen. He is a professor of economics at Kingston University, London, and the economic advisor to Asymmetric Return Capital. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want. And I very much encourage Stephen, if I can go to you in London, um, it's been a very yeah. turbulent week. How do you interpret it all? Um, a lot of people are pointing fingers at China, uh, but China is this, the only maybe important difference from the, if, uh, the last few financial crises that we've had is that China is at the center of this one. Yeah, well, China was a bystander for the last one. Uh, but what happened, of course, was a dramatic drop in its exports volume to the rest of the world. And its response to that, after seeing a dramatic increase in unemployment and all the shifts of people back to the rural, uh, from, the, from the city, uh, was to tell their banks to lend. And when the Communist Party in China tells you to lend, you <laughs> lend. And a, a massive increase in lending occurred. It went from, for about 10 years, the ratio of private debt to GDP was about 100%. It rose to 180%. That's on their figures, which, of course, would understate the real situation between 2000 and and 2015. And of course, that rate of growth of debt is actually three times as fast as America and Japan had during their bubble economies. It couldn't be sustained. That's why I said well, earlier this year, I came out saying 100% certainty of a crisis in, in China in the next two years. It's a question of when, not if. Okay. And that's, that's what happened. It, it happened actually faster than I thought it would. Okay, Mitch, if I can go to you. Um, for years, uh, uh, Western capitals were clamoring about the Chinese do something about its currency to make it more um, uh, equal and real value to other currencies. And when it did it, everybody criticized. I mean, thanks for having me today, Peter. Yeah, um, right. The first thing that we've got to think about is the Fed policies, yep. the Federal Reserve policies that have distorted valuations, created the history's greatest bubble and wealth inequality that we've ever seen. This has led to malinvestment across the board. You know, what's missing from this great European and ECB and United States recovery is organic growth, capital expenditure, quality jobs, wage growth, and savings. Okay, last night, Japan, Kuroda, was here in New York, and he spoke. And he said that their QE, pro, QQQQE, which has been going on for 30 years, they don't learn a lesson, is yep. going according to mm -hmm. plan. You know, I don't know what exactly his plan is. And exports are dropping like a rock there. That economy is dead. It has been for 30 years. The European um, paradigm, the United States, and all of Asia should have learned that quantitative easing and money printing, yeah. trying to get pay your way out of debt with more debt is not the solution or the way forward. What we've done in the equity markets, the bond markets, and property markets have created massive bubbles, asset bubbles everywhere. We've gone slowly up the staircase for the past year or two years or six years, and now we're going to go right down the elevator shaft. Okay. Mark, one of the interesting things here is, of course, a lot of this uh, uh, started in China, but China is pretty well insulated from uh, the more global effects. It has a hybrid economy, and as Stephen said, when the Communist Party tells you to do this or do that, the, the, the state-owned banks do that. Uh, so it's, but with the real impact is, is that you have these anemic economies in the United States and in Europe. They're the ones that are going to feel this the most. Yeah, that's right. I think the main problem is with the two largest economies in the world, which is the United States, and if you take the European Union as one economy, uh, that's even bigger. And those are very weak. Uh, you know, the European Union economy is just barely caught up with its uh, pre-recession yeah. level of, of GDP after uh, more than seven years. And the uh, U.S. economy is about 8% uh, ahead of its pre-recession peak, and uh, China's about 80% uh, yep. above that. So, uh, you know, this is the real problem. These are the U.S. The eurozone recovery has been mostly non-existent, and the U.S. economy has had a weak recovery. Those are the main problems. China's got problems too, but it's shown in the past that it is able to resolve them 
relatively quickly. As Steve noted uh, during the last, uh, during the world financial crisis and recession uh, of 2008, 2009, in 2009, uh, China lost, uh, its exports fell by 10 percent. The economy still grew very rapidly. Yep. And yep. so they can uh, fix this, and they, they probably will. But most importantly, the European Union and the U.S. have not uh, used the available uh, policy tools uh, to well, push their okay, economies. Mark, you used the term tool. Okay, let's let me go back to Stephen here. The toolbox is the box is empty because you they, you can't uh, fiddle anymore with the interest rates. This is one of the great dilemmas that the uh, the well, West has the, 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 the West is abused and used, and you can't return to it. Go ahead, Stephen. Well, they, they've got a model of the world, which is the, 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 the Fed is dominated by what's called neoclassical economics. They've got a model of the world in which everything runs to equilibrium, and all you've got to do is tweak the interest rates to control inflation and the unemployment rate. And that was blown out of the water by yep. the 2008 crisis, but they haven't modified the model at all. All they've thrown in is the possibility of what they call financial frictions into the crazy mathematical models they put together of capitalism. And that's what's leading them astray, because what's actually gone on uh, totally blindsiding them in the whole process. There's a huge private debt bubble. And the person who explained that best was Irving Fisher and then Hyman Minsky. And they've got none of that wisdom inside their, their, their thinking. What they should be doing is trying to reduce the level of private debt. That's what they should be targeting. But they don't even think it's a problem. So all they're doing is playing with the two tools they've got, which is the interest rate and the capacity to increase the reserves of the banks. But that's having, if I can use a bit of Australianism here, bugger all impact on the real economy. Exactly. As, as Mark said, it's just inflated the asset market. Yeah, ex ex Mitch, if I can go back to you, again, the real economy. Since 2008, 2009, there has been no real investment in the real economy. The, the continued story of the financialization of the economy. No one in the West is in, <coughs> investing in infrastructure, in people, in real jobs, re reality. They're not even investing in reality. They've continued the same model. If you look, what we can see from durable goods, which came out yesterday, capital expenditures are non-existent. Yeah. What you've got is you've got the Fed that's been consistent with policy. Unfortunately, they've been consistently wrong with policy. They haven't gotten it right at all. And basically, the St. Louis Fed came out last week and said that there's no evidence that QE has been beneficial to yeah. creating aggregate yeah. demand that we're supposed to be seeing. So this creates a bigger problem. We haven't had a correction in the equities markets in six years, okay? So we're seeing a little bit of a pullback right now, but it's not a correction. Look, the DAX, Germany's stock market, dropped 23% from the peak to last week. Now it's only down about 18 or 17% because we're, we're partying like it's 1929. Look, <laughs> all these problems haven't gone away. Yep. If we look at the emerging mm -hmm. markets, I mean, look at Venezuela. Venezuela is a typical example of hyperinflation and what's gonna happen. You know, you've got Kuroda, I, I hate to go back to this, but last night, what he said, if you read the text of his speech or listened to it, you, you could see that it's the same thing that he's been spinning out, the narrative, since for the past 18 months. Everything's fine. There is no currency war. There's no currency war. Are you kidding me? In November <laughs> of last year, I went out. I went out and said, look, oil prices at $68, and I was the only person yep. who said this. I said, I'm not interested in buying oil here because it's going much lower. Janet Yellen from the Fed came out, and she said oil prices and commodities declines are transitory. Janet, it's almost a year later, and we're much, much lower. Now, what about the high-yield energy defaults? How is the Fed going to deal with that? Because the malinvestment from the quantitative easing yep. has led people to invest in shale development, the break even on these projects is probably $80 a barrel, and there's trillions of dollars of that out there. I mean, there are so many minefields out there that are yet to explode. If people think that these equities markets are going to stay buoyant amongst this, you know, it's really pretty hilarious. It is we're still well, it's, extremely overvalued. It's not hilarious. The US it's stock it's market tragic. Is only down 7 it, well, now. that's it. You know, because quantitative easing. If I go to Mark here, all that went in there is just to pump up pri uh, stock prices. It didn't create anything. This is what was my big gripe with quantitative easing. I mean, if it was directed to do something, to invest something into something, create something, that would be all nice and fine with me. But it didn't work that way. Everybody just stuffed their pockets with it and, and increased their portfolios without affecting the real economy. Well, I don't really agree with that. I think that the quantitative easing did have a positive uh, impact. And I don't think the stock market is uh, in bubble territory anywhere near 
the way it was in the late 90s or before it burst in the bubble burst in 2000. If you look at the price to earnings ratio and you take into consideration that interest rates, short term interest rates are zero, uh, it's not anything like that. So it's not necessarily going to collapse. This all the catastrophic theories, especially the people on the right who have been projecting inflation for years now as a result of quantitative easing, they're completely wrong. You have uh, almost zero inflation in both U.S. and the European Union. So uh, the, the picture is not as horrible as we look, and you know, as, as some people are describing, and I mean, the bad part is, we, you know, we're still down three or four million jobs yep. uh, in the United States uh, compared to where we should be. Uh, because people have dropped out of the labor force because they can't find jobs. So our unemployment rate is a little bit deceptive. But on the other hand, even using that measure of unemployment, uh, unemployment is twice as high in the Eurozone. And why is that? That's because their central bank didn't do what our central bank did. They instead uh, did the opposite. They, didn't, they failed to act as a lender of last resort. And they drove uh, the Eurozone, the more vulnerable con uh, economies, into deep depression. And that's why they have, and, and of course, then they used uh, fiscal policy, which, by the way, nobody has mentioned here. But when we talk about policy tools, you know, we had a stimulus here, the Peter, opposite of what they did in Europe. And so Europe is a much bigger mess than the United States because we have a central bank that did its job and because we had a little bit of a stimulus. And we didn't do the terrible pro-cyclical policies and force our economy into a second recession. Okay, gentlemen, I, I have did. to jump oh, in. So I, have, I have to go to a short break here. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the global economy. Stay with our team. Okay, Mitch, I want to go back to you in New York. You wanted to jump in right before we went to the break. Go right ahead. Yeah, Mark, I would have to disagree on the valuation point because I'm actually trading it. I'm not looking at it from a theoretical perspective. So, you know, when you assume a fa fantasy zero interest rate, which is what the Fed is, and you have investment, malinvestment on the basis of that, is cyclically adjusted like uh, Schiller's index for CAPE. We've only seen valuations this high two other times in history. And I'd have to look at that. I can point you to companies like Shake Shack that were valued as high as 5.1 billion with only 57 shops and no revenues. Or we can look at Tesla's valuation, or we can look at Amazon or Netflix, companies that don't make money. This is a NASDAQ 2.0 dot com bubble again and all over. What they've also done, the Fed and QE, is they've made, they've distorted the bond market so people yeah. can't price risk pro uh, properly. Yeah. Just about a week and a half ago or two weeks ago, the 10-year bond was trading at 251. It dropped to 199, and we're up at around 222 today. These moves are not normal. I want everybody to understand this is not normal, and this is caused by the central bank's meddling. There's no price discovery anymore. There are no real markets. We're living in a fantasy land, and we're going to reprice, so people better prepare for it. Okay, Mark, you want to react to that before I go to Stephen? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, if you want to point to individual stocks, there's, there's individual stocks that are grossly overvalued. But overall, if you take the, the P-E ratio for the whole S&P 500, for example, it's nowhere, it, it's, it's not yeah, but you can't, you, can't in, uh, you can't use that, you can't use that, you can't use. And you have to, can I finish? Go ahead, can Mark. I finish? I didn't. Go interrupt. ahead, Mark. Let me just Go ahead. finish the sentence, okay? And you're going to have, of course, uh, uh, higher valuations in the stock. People are going to be willing to pay more for stock. When they can't get uh, interest, you know, when they're getting zero interest rate short term and very low. And those short term interest rates have uh, lower interest rates have helped the economy relative to where it would be. And again, just, you know, if you want to make the comparison, look at what the Central Bank of Europe did. Look at how they uh, actually undermined the economy and how when the uh, weaker economies became dependent on borrowing from the IMF and the European authorities. They push them further into recession and depression. That's what you have in, in Greece now, a seventh year of depression. And Spain, 22% unemployment. So that's the alternative you're uh, talking about if the Fed and, and, the, uh, and, of course, the rest of the government are not willing to have countercyclical policies. The problem is we haven't had enough on the fiscal side. We need a stimulus. We need investment in infrastructure. We need to create okay. more jobs I don't, here. I don't, yeah, that's but the what, QE, 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 the, you know, quantitative means was supposed to be part of that there. Stephen, you wanted to jump in there. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's fiscal policy is the important missing element there, as, as he's been saying. And the, what, that's what's really the difference between Europe and America. It wasn't QE so much as the fact that in America, the Fed, Federal Reserve basically has, thank God, no uh, power to do other than support what the Treasury wants to do. And when you had a 15 per cent of GDP deficit, they backstopped the financing of it. Of course, in Europe, with the ridiculous rules in the Maastricht Treaty, governments are allowed to run no more than a 3 per cent of GDP deficit, which is actually less than the average America's run for the last 40 or 50 years. So it's crazy rules in, in Europe, which have you know, hamstrung what the governments would have done without the euro, and that's actually caused the depression. I completely agree on that front. The QE itself has really been saying, let's see if we can cause a wealth effect. Let's inflate asset prices, make people feel wealthier, and they'll spend more. Now, this is what you know, I rarely agree with Paul Krugman, but he calls this stuff confidence fairy stuff. And that's what it really is. <laughs> if, you want, if you want to get the real economy kicking on, what you've got to do is throw money at the real economy. It's ridiculous, people talk though. about queuing, call it money, <laughs> money printing. What right. they're doing is they're buying bonds off the banks. And the banks therefore get extra reserve assets, so they don't lend the reserve assets. Uh, the, the money actually doesn't turn up in people's bank accounts. If you wanted to do genuine quantitative easing, it's been called PQE or People's Cure Quantitative Easing over here, you'd use the reserves capacity to do that, to put money into people's bank accounts. And I would then require that to be used to cancel private debt for the recipients of that who are in debt. That's what we've got to get, get the private levels of debt down. And that's the indirect impact of some of the fiscal policy, of course, with Europe's obsession about keeping uh, government deficits down, private debts continue to maintain the same ratio to GDP because GDP has collapsed. So we okay. have a real mess of the wrong models of economic. Okay, care. wrong models here. That's, that's, okay, good. Key word there. Okay, Mitch, I want to go back to you. You know, in the West, we've seen decades of deregulation, and we've seen the, uh, what that led to in 2008, 2009, and you could probably make the case to the today. But China hasn't done that. I mean, isn't China in the position right now to say we're going to stop learning from you folks because you screw it up, and it gets worse and worse every time we listen to you? They do, they don't have a they, their their economy is very regulated. OK, and we do have a lot of people in the top there in the political elite there. Uh, they're watching very closely what's happening to their assets and the direction of their economy. Do you think the Chinese are going to rethink the Western experience? Go ahead. Well, you know, I think you've got to look at what's happened with debt. And, you know, what is the, what is the Fed's mandate? They claim that they have a dual mandate of price stability and employment. Now, I don't see anywhere in that mandate where manipulating the stock market and bond prices is part of that mandate. But every time the stock market has a correction, like Bullard jumps out and he says QE4, and then it pops back up. Or yesterday, you have ex-Goldman Dudley come out and say, well, I'm not so keen on a September hike anymore. Now, back to China, what's going on there? As Steve pointed out earlier, their debt has increased exponentially. It's gone from $7 trillion to $30 trillion in, what, five or six years? Now, I don't know. That's just been printing presses and printing presses. I don't know if they're going to appoint Mr. Pan Z as their next <laughs> finance minister. But quite frankly, I you can't that. believe any of the numbers that are coming out of China. So, you know, it's kind of incredible. You know, it's an incredible story. And that's why this is Planet Ponzi. And the descriptor for my book is perfect because it is Planet Ponzi. All of these are a Ponzi scheme. The, the interesting thing that I heard both Mark and Steve say that any economist or most economists on uh, the mainstream media have failed to utter is the word depression. Mm. Now, unemployment mm. is underreported. I think a lot of these statistics are not fit for purpose. I think it's extremely higher in the United States. The U3 is fantasy. It's U6. We've got is. the lowest participation rate since Jimmy Carter was in the White House in 1977. In Spain, youth unemployment is as high as 70 percent. So what we've done and what I say quantitative easing has done in the ECB, what they've done is they've, they've stolen from prudent savers and students. Look at tuition hikes. You guys are, uh, Steve, you're a professor. Tuition has gone up exponentially in the past seven years, as have mm. student loan obligations, to $1.3 yeah. But wages haven't gone up accordingly. Yeah. So how is this going to get yeah. paid off, and how do you square the circle on this? Okay, Steve, yeah, we, that's what a really we've got good going point. on here is a. Uh, go ahead, jump in. What go we've ahead. got going on here is you say, we've had QE's inflated asset markets in the middle of a depression. 
And you're quite right, the, the conventional economists haven't admitted that a depression has occurred. It's a debt deflation. They don't even understand the very concept of that. So they've left this all out and they think by inflating the asset markets they can drag up the real economy. And you're right, I mean, if you, the real indicator to look at for an unemployment is not U3, which is a fantasy number. It's the ratio for pe people with jobs to the population of America. You can get that from the St. Louis Fred database and you'll see there that, yep, it's down at, uh, you got right. back to levels yeah. that when there was a far lower level of female participation in the workforce. So it is a depression. And uh, the, the inflating the asset markets has not worked. Again, it's because they're following a fallacious model of the economy where, ironically, money, banks, debt and stock markets don't actually exist. So it's no damn wonder they don't understand the real world. Mark, how would you... Wait Can in I there. say go something ahead, about the same people? We no, 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 let's go to Mark. Yeah, I just about the... Go ahead. Let's, let's get the statistics straight, okay? It's true, as I said, that the 5.3% unemployment we have today is, is misleading because we have three or four, we're down three or four million jobs be, uh, from where we should be if we take into account the people who have dropped out of the labor force, as Steve said. However, uh, the, we still have a consistent series for the unemployment rate, and in October of 2009, it was 10%. So by the same measure, uh, the economy has created millions of jobs. It is actually recovery as compared to Europe, the Eurozone, where unemployment, again, by the same measure and in a consistent series, is 11.3% uh, uh, or 11.1%. Oh, there's no, there's no doubt Europe has so, worse. See, I'm not defending Europe. It, it does. So it, how do you yeah. explain, how do you explain so, the participation so rate? We, we can still use the participation this. Rate. Let, Mark, well, let, let, Mark finish. Finish. let Mark finish his point. I'll go to Mitch. Go ahead. People, the participation rate has fallen because the economy is weak. It's a weak recovery, and people can't find jobs, and so they give up looking for them. So, again, the problem is we haven't had the fiscal policy that we need. I think... At least Steve and I are agreed on that. Yeah, but I don't see yeah. how the quantitative easing uh, is is the is the villain here. The real problem is well, not the no, villain. Steve, 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 and uh, Mark, 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 I'm not saying it's the villain here, but it was supposed to do something, and apparently it hasn't done it. That's all I'm saying here. I'm not saying it's a villain and here. St. Louis Fred has come no, out. No, it was supposed, to, to, let me go it was to, Mitch supposed to do a limited amount. Okay, well, Mitch, let me go to Mitch here. I mean, again, tell me about what kind of all those millions and millions of jobs. What is that, McDonald's? No, yeah, but that's it. It's not, it's the quality jobs. I suggest that you take a look at those BLS statistics that you can find on Fred. And if you look at what's happened in the, uh, the workforce from 25 to 55, participation's absolutely cratered. And what's happened because of the Fed policies is they forced the 55 year olds back into the workforce mm. at, at Walmart. So the jobs that are being created are bartenders, waitresses, service sector. The high quality, high paying jobs aren't there anymore. Asset bubbles have been inflated everywhere. Fiscal policy is lacking. You know, tax revenues are spending much more than revenues, which creates, creates a problem in and of itself. And we have the same people that keep, uh, I guess, Albert Einstein said it best when insanity, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting to get a different right. result. Let me, let me go, let me, let me go, let me go to London here. Let me go to Stephen. learned a lesson Let me go to, that's exactly. Has anybody learned any lessons here? Stephen, go ahead. 30 seconds. No, the, uh, they haven't learned the lessons. The conventional economists are trying to push the world back into their model that was inappropriate in the first place. Rebels like me are getting more of an airing in the media, but in academia, it's still the dominant school that's trying to say nothing went wrong and no trouble here. Look away, please. Okay, Mark, real quick, 20 seconds, go ahead. Yeah, I think the most important thing right now is they're debating whether to raise interest rates, and that's really, I think, a big mistake. There's no excuse for raising interest rates now. Inflation is 0.2% in the United States over the last year, and they just really want to do it in order to keep wages. From okay, rising. Mark, I have to jump in here. We've run out of time, gentlemen. Fascinating discussion. Many thanks to my guests in New York, Washington, and in London. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Cross Talk Rules. I love you.